Make sure your Bible is still open there to 1 Samuel chapter 24. What to do when you're cornered. As I was studying this this last week, I really believe we find this is probably one of the greatest victories, one of the greatest battles in David's life. He had lots of them, lots of battles, lots of victories. From even as a young man, being a bear, fighting the bear and fighting the lion, fighting Goliath, fighting the Philistines, as we find so many times, even when Saul had sent him out to kill 100 so he could marry Saul's daughter. And he brought in the 200, lots of battles, lots of victories. But I think this is one that's probably one of his greatest battles, one of his hardest battles, and one of the great victories of his life. But to the world, they'll never know it. I doubt if it was this victory we see here was going to be uh, in the evening news or in the newspaper or on some Twitter feed. No, I don't think it was, but it was one of the great battles, one of the great victories in his life. It helped make David what he was. It made, helped make David develop and grow into what he was going to be, the type of king he was going to be, the type of man that he should be. If he'd not won this battle, I don't think he would have been the king that God wanted him to be. I don't think he'd have the spirit God wanted him to have. I don't think his life would have been quite the same. Because as we go through there, we find David growing in this case and maturing. By the way, you and I are always, should be, still in the growing process. Always maturing, always growing, always learning from every battle and every situation we have in our life. And so, so it is with here. And the victory today, and this one as we see tonight, the great battle and the victory was the battle with himself. The battle with himself. These are the greatest battles and the hardest battles we face are those we have with ourselves. Sometimes we think, well, it's with this person or with these people. But I guarantee you, when you're trying to do right, when you're trying to walk with God, when you're trying to obey Him, those are the great battles in your life. When you find yourself in a corner, when you find yourself with your back against the wall, when you find yourself in an unusual circumstance. But here it is, this battle with himself. It says in Proverbs 16, 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So it's just like a battle for a city as we control our spirit, and control our minds, and control our spirit. That is a great battle. How many understand you've been in a battle like that? where we're trying to control our attitude, trying to control our spirit, trying to control our actions to do what is right. Proverbs 25, 28, He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So we're looking tonight at David here dealing with his own battle, the battle of in his own spirit, the battle of his own decisions, the battle that he felt pressures on how he was going to conduct himself. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, I think the quote's there in your notes, it says, Be... Beware of no man more than of yourself. We carry our worst enemies within us. The victory over self is the hardest battle, but once won, it brings the sweetest triumph. So tonight we're looking about what to do when you're in the corner. This is a prime example of that battle within himself and the battle to do right. We know the story. We've been following it somewhat off and on through the last couple of weeks. Saul is out to kill David. He's been doing it for years now, after David, night and day, trying to destroy him, trying to find him, trying to kill him. Just recently, when David had first gone on the run, the priests that had helped him, Saul heard about it, and he came and killed all the priests that had helped him. Not only that, but he killed the whole city of the priests. Every animal, every child, every woman, every man. He had killed all those folks, and David knew that because David had been in fear and on the run, and because of that he had been deceptive, because of that he had lied. And now he's coming to a new confrontation. So Saul had, just before he found David, he had gone back to fight the Philistines. And now he's back and he said, David is in the caves. David is in the mountains where the caves are. And so Saul took a thousand men with him to go after David and his 600. And we find a story there that uh, Saul had gone up. David was in the cave and some of his men were in the cave. They were backed up in there. And as Saul was coming to find him, Saul had gone into the cave to take a nap, to take some rest. And while he was there inside the cave. But, so picture it, there is David. 
and his men backed up against the wall, in the corner, if you will, in the cave, and in comes the man that's been spending years trying to kill him. Here comes the man that has purposed his whole life to find David and to slay him, and there he is laying there. His men, as we see the story, said, no doubt they whispered, David, this is the guy, this is the time, kill him, kill him. This is your opportunity. God has put him right in your hand. And David has to decide what he's going to do. So David's there in the corner. You know, we find ourselves in corners many times. Sometimes we put ourselves in the corner. Decisions we make, decisions we've chosen, sins we've chosen to do, those sins put us in that corner where now we're in the corner, there's no way out. The idea of being in the corner is just like David being in the cave, his back to the wall. There's no escape. The enemy is right there. The one is trying to kill him right there. What's he going to do? And there's just no way out. There's no, nothing to the right, nothing to the left. He's just in a corner. Sometimes we get ourselves in the corner. Sometimes our enemy puts us in the corner. Satan is good at putting us in a corner, amen? It's just like Saul was trying to put him in a corner. So sometimes we put ourselves in a corner. Sometimes the enemy puts us in a corner. But I guarantee you what helped David in that case and will help you and I is realize is God always allows us into the corner. Are you listening to me? God always allows us into that corner to see what we will do. Uh, that, that understanding that while you're in the corner and the pressure is on to what you're going to do, the pressure is on to make some decision, the pressure is on is how you're going to act, it's good to remember God has allowed us to be in that corner. He puts us sometimes in the corner to test us. He puts us sometimes in that corner to try us. Certainly puts us in that corner to prove us and improve us. See, so many times we find ourselves in a, in a, in a straight fix We find ourselves against the wall. We find ourselves in the corner. We find ourselves with our back against the cave. And we say, this is not fair. This is not good. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a great opportunity for God to prove us, but also improve us. As we see David here, he now has an opportunity to improve his walk with God, to strengthen his heart with God, to strengthen to do right. Because just before we saw, because of his fear, he had lied and had deceived, and it cost many people their lives. So now he's in another place. He has to make another decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to respond in fear? Am I going to respond deception? Am I going to respond uh, in my own flesh? Or am I going to do what God wants me to do? And knowing he has that choice, that helps him build what he ought to do. So for us tonight, we're going to learn what to do when we find ourselves in a corner. And the pressure is on. You know, a lot of times pressures can come and we can kind of skirt the pressure a little bit. We'll kind of slide out this way or we'll slide out this way. We'll make some change. But there's no way for David to get away from it here. So you and I sometimes will find ourselves in a corner. Temptation will come upon us to do wrong. The pressure is will we do right or not. So tonight, very simply, just three main points we see from this and what to do when you're in the corner. What to do when you're cornered and there's no way out. Are you with me tonight? Oh, It's going to come. So very quickly, number one. What to do when we are cornered. Number one, stand by your convictions. Stand by your convictions. Here we find David's men say, you kill him. And David says, no, I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. I will not. He's there in front of me. I have the opportunity. You're challenging me to do it, but I will not do it. Stand by your convictions. David was tempted, no doubt. Here's an opportunity to put an end to all this. No more troubles, no more trials, all much better. But he says, no, he's going to stand by his conviction that he would not stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed. By the way, you and I need convictions. You and I have to have some things that we say, I will and will not do. But those convictions must be based on Scripture. Those convictions must be based upon the Word of God. Those convictions must be based upon what God has instructed us. Because if our convictions are based on my preference, they may not be the right convictions. If they're based on the time we're living in, they're probably not the right convictions. If they're based upon what the crowd does and what the crowd thinks, they're probably not the right convictions. How many understand the world and the Bible do not go along together? And so we have to have our convictions from here so we can stand no matter what. So the idea is that God has put some principle in the Word of God. He's given some command in the Word of God. And I make the decision by His grace and with His power. I'm going to stand for that. And it's my conviction. I will not change it. I will not alter it. Regardless of circumstances, regardless of pressures, regardless of where I find myself, 
pragmatism well out, no, 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 just going to obey my convictions based upon the Word of God. Now, it's easy to stand by your convictions in the classroom. In here tonight, it's easy to stand by your convictions. It's easy to say, amen, preacher, that's right. Amen, preacher, we ought not to do that. Amen, preacher, we ought to be doing that. It's real easy in the classroom, if you will, in the church room, it's easy to stand by it. I could stand up here and say, well, should, anybody, should we all take a drink of alcohol? The answer would be, no, we should not do that. Easy convictions, easy answer here. But when you find yourself in the corner, when you find yourself in a position you never thought you would be in, and the pressures are upon you, and the pressures to do wrong is upon you, can you then stand by your convictions? It's easy in the classroom when people are cheering you on. Well, should I, should I take that drink? The answer is no. Should I let that person touch me for a young person? No. Should I say something when the conversation gets lurid and kind of foul? Yes, we know we should. It's easy to stand for those convictions when we're here in the classroom, when we're here gathered together, but when we get in the cave, when we're in the corner, when the pressure is on, that's when it's hard to stand for our convictions. That's when it's hard to make a stand and do what is right. Stand by your convictions. David's conviction here was from a godly principle. The godly principle. He said, I will not stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. That's a principle from the Bible. In 1 Samuel 26, a little bit farther on, when another situation similar to this arises, and David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? He says, nobody, if God's put him in a power, if God's put him in place and God's promoted them over me, he says, how can I stretch forth my hand and not be guiltless? He gives the principle how he can do that. And he goes on, he says, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die or he shall descend into battle. So he said, I cannot stretch forth my hand against the Lord's, Lord's anointed. He put him in power. He put him in position. And I'm going to let God take care of him. He said, he'll die in battle or God will destroy him. God will have to take care of that. He says, but I'm not going to usurp God's authority. I'm not going to usurp my position above God's and do what I think I ought to do. So it was a godly principle of God's placing of authorities over us. Romans 13, we know that so well. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whoso therefore resists the power, resists the ordination, ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. In other words, he says, this is God's leader. God, we saw not long ago, God lifts up and God puts down. God lifts up and God does what class? Puts down. It's true. The election comes. The election may not go the way we want it to go, but we've got to know God puts up and God puts down. As simple as that. Well, I don't think they're right. I think they're wrong. I think they're vile. I think they're going to hurt us. So it is with Saul. Here comes Saul. And David said, I'm not going to stretch forth my hand in order because God has put him there in that place. I'm not going to kill him. So he had that conviction to stand by. So when the pressure's on and you're in the corner, I mean, you're in a corner and the world starts saying, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to stand by those thoughts? You used to say this. Can you still say it now? Stand by your convictions. When we think about standing for our, our, by our convictions, number one, we need to beware carnal counsel. Beware carnal counsel. I guarantee you, when you feel yourself in the corner and the pressure's on, the devil's going to make sure somebody's there to whisper something in your ears. The devil's going to make sure that somebody's going to come along and say, or you'll come up with the answer yourself that is very carnal and very fleshly. Look back, if you would, at verse number 4 of our text. And the men of David, so there he is, Saul's laying at his feet. David is standing there, and his men say, this is it, this is your chance. Verse 4, and the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, we'll cover that aspect in a minute, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy in thy hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. So it says, kill him. There it is. Here's the chance. God has put this fella, your enemy, in at your feet. So David has a conviction. And here comes his companions 
His army guy is saying, violate your conviction and kill him. Obviously, God has put him in here. So go ahead and violate your conviction. Beware carnal counsel. It may seem like the right thing. It may seem like an okay thing to do. But David already knew the conviction he had from the word of God, what he was supposed to do. Now, they seem to be quoting scripture. Guess what? How many know the devil quotes scripture also? The devil quotes scripture. He takes it out of context and he twists it just enough to make it apply to what he thinks we want to hear. Satan can quote and twist scripture. In the wilderness, where Jesus was being tempted, he used Scripture. He said, doesn't the Bible say? He said, doesn't God say? Taking it out of context, trying to get Jesus to compromise his convictions, to compromise the truth and do wrong. In the Garden of Eden with Eve, we find that the David, the Satan then, quoting Scripture, hath not God said, and he does it, but he pulls it out of context. By the way, I believe we find here these men pull this little thought out of context from chapter 20, 23. Look at chapter 23 and verse number 4. So, if you remember back, we find the enemy, the Philistines, had gone after a city, and David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines. So here is, no doubt, some aspect of that is they're going to deliver, God's going to deliver the enemy in your hand. So they take that principle, they take that thought and apply it to this situation to pressure David to go ahead and kill Saul. That's why you and I must know the Scriptures. We must know the context of the Scriptures. We must know the truth of the Scriptures. We must know exactly how God would have us. Are you out there tonight? We have to understand that because the devil will come and he will use a Scripture. And the Scripture on the surface may sound right. It may seem applicable to the situation. But unless we've studied to show ourselves approved and able to rightly divide the word of truth, we're labeled to fall for it. So here it is. It says, God has done this. Boy, I tell you what, there's a lot of preachers, there's a lot of Christians that come up to you when you're in the corner, when your back's against the wall, and you're there in that cave, and the situation is there, and you say, I'm not sure what I should do. I have pressure to do what's wrong. And they say, well, then, for you ought to do this. We need to know the Scriptures. Beware. Carnal counsel. A lot of bad counsel in the Bible. Job 2 9, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Guess what? Job, who did not, he might find that a very tempting proposition. When you think about what he'd lost, you talk about the physical suffering. She's saying, just go ahead and curse God and die. Maybe curse God so he will kill you, or maybe just curse God and kill yourself. I mean, he was suffering. He was scraping sores off his body. He had lost all his family. He was in miserable pain from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot. And she says, just die. Oh, be very careful. Sometimes those words would seem appealing. 2 Samuel 13, 3, But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shema, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. Remember, he came to Amnon and convinced him how he could rape his sister. He said, you shouldn't have that problem. He was, Amnon was in such love or lust for his sister that he was sick. He was just sick about it and just physically sick from it. And his friend said, why should you, being the king's son, have to deal with this? He said, this is what you ought to do. And he gave him some very carnal advice. You and I, we have to make sure we stand by our convictions and beware carnal counsel. Be very careful when you hear it. Know the word of God. Know what your convictions are based upon. Number two, not only do we need to beware carnal culture, or counsel. Number two, beware compromise of convictions. Beware compromising convictions David's conviction was not to stretch his hand forth against the Lord's anointed but I believe he compromised his conviction he cut corners if you will when he cut off the corner 
of Saul's robe. First of all, he had to have a sword in his hand to cut off the robe. No doubt that was Goliath's sword. So I, we don't know. We're not, we don't have windows into David's mind and David's thinking. But at that time, his, friend said, his men said, kill him. Here it is, kill him. David, with Goliath's sword in his hand, went over and stood above Saul. There he stood and got close to Saul. I don't know but whether or not he was contemplating, should I kill him? What should I do? Uh, there he is. Here's my sword. Here I am. There's the answer to all my problems. There my friends and people are trying to counsel me to kill him. Should I kill him? He's trying to kill me. He's been trying to kill me for years. There he is. He decided not to kill him, but he did decide to take a corner of his robe. He said, Preacher, how do you know that's wrong? Because the Bible said as soon as he did, his heart smote him. As soon as he did that, his heart says, What are you doing? Yes, you, didn't, you did not kill him, but you did stretch forth your hand on the Lord's anointed. You did consider it. You did take that sword and cut it off. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be careful that we do not. We do not compromise our convictions. We may not completely give up on them, but we're in danger always of compromising them to relieve some pressure, compromising them to go a little bit along the way, to go a little ways down the wrong path. We find David then compromising his convictions thought is this way, never cut corners from doing right. Never cut corners from doing, don't you do it, don't you do it. But the temptation is there, I'm just going to cut the corner just a little bit. I'll just do just part of it, yeah. He took the sword, he did not kill him, but he cut the corner off of it. Just like Daniel. Daniel did not compromise his conviction. Daniel had a compromise. He would not defile himself with the king's meat or the king's wine. I mean, that was a conviction. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure the, the temptation came was, would be to compromise that conviction. He could have said, well, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. But you know, he's not going to eat bad meat all the time. I think I'll just watch and I'll just take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I think I'll eat just a little bit of it. Or I'll just do that. No, we just, he just stood himself. He says, no, he refused. He said, I will not defile myself. Do not cut corners in your convictions. Cutting corners in our convictions, things that are right, always ends badly. Cutting corners in our convictions always, cutting corners in God's Word always ends badly. And again, David, as soon as he cut it off, his heart struck him. Boy, he said, I blew it. I knew I shouldn't have done it. That was just terrible. And it struck him in the heart. But cutting corners in our convictions always ends badly. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 7, Saul should have known that. It says God had told Saul to go kill all the Amalekites, not leave anybody alive, not leave any animal alive. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Hiva until the coming to Sir. It is over against Egypt. He did. He went to battle like God said. He killed a bunch of them like God said. He was supposed to wipe them all out. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So he killed all the people like he was supposed to, but he gave. He did most of it, but he compromised on his order. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuge, that they destroyed. Acts 5, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, compromising. In Judges 1, 27, neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beshanam and her towns. They drove out part, but not all of them. Wow. So, beware compromising convictions. He said, I'm not going to stretch forth my hand, but there he is. They said, kill him. He went to the edge, and he says, I'll just do this. Oh, be careful. And David knew it the minute he did it. By the way, so will we know the moment we do it. If it's a conviction from the Word of God, and if you've got the Holy Spirit inside of there, and when we violate conviction or cut corners on the convictions and violate part of it, we know it. How many know what I'm talking about? You said, I'll never do this. And the day you do just part of it, oh, it smites you. So, by the way, that's a good thing that it smites you. Don't, 
When the Holy Spirit smites you, you say, whoa, you just cut the corners on this. You cut the corner on that command. You cut the corner on this. Don't refuse. We saw it this morning. Don't refuse the Holy Spirit. Don't reject the Holy Spirit. Don't resist the Holy Spirit. But be like David said, wow, I blew it. And get right with what he did. So be glad that it happens. Obey every prompting of the Holy Spirit. So stand by your convictions. When you find yourself in the corner, there's David. Find himself in the back of the cave. His enemy right there who's trying to kill him. His men say trying to kill him. He says, but I'm not supposed to kill him. He is the Lord's anointed. Yes, I'm going to be the next king. And if I killed him, I would be able to take the throne now. And all my problems would go away. Oh, be careful when you start thinking about all your problems are going away by violating the word of God or by violating your convictions. Beware carnal counsel. Because when you've got that pressure, they'll come along and say, this is what you ought to do. Be careful. Make sure it's all scriptural when you get to counsel. Number two, not just stand by your convictions, strengthen your comrades. Strengthen your comrades. Look at verse number seven. So these are the guys that said, kill him, kill him, kill him. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. You go ahead and kill him. Chapter 24, verse number seven. Back at verse number six to get the context. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this. Back into verse 5, Genesis 1, 1, no, verse 5. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. As soon as he did it, God smote his heart. And he said unto his men that had told him to kill him, and he had gone over with the sword and cut off the corner of his robe, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. What thing? What he just did. He said, the Lord forbid that I should do this. Oh, he said, I shouldn't have done that. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise up to rise against Saul. So David went to his men and he stayed them. They were still ready to kill him. I mean, they're on the run too. Saul's been trying to kill them. And so God, they find David then stayed them. It's interesting, the word stayed there in the Hebrew means to tear up. In other words, he tore them up with his words. He probably said more than those few words. How many understand we don't have every word everybody said in the Bible? All right. He tells what he wants. So he stayed them. He tore them up with these words. He says, what are you talking about? I shouldn't have done that. Yes, I cut off his skirt. Yes, I cut off the corner. Yes, I shut corners on my, compromise, on my convictions. He says, but we're not going to go any farther. He says, no, he stayed them. He tore them up with his words. He tore into them with his words, strong words, teaching words, encouraging words. Ladies and gentlemen, when we find ourselves with our backs against the wall, when we find ourselves in a corner and the world's trying to get us to compromise and the world's trying to get us to do wrong and the world is trying to go through hoops and circles just to, just to get our, what we want done, those that are with us, we need to encourage them, our friends and comrades also, to do right. Are you listening to me? We need to encourage and strengthen our family to do right. We need to strengthen and encourage the other Christians to do right. These are his comrades, but he says, no, no. He began to strengthen them. He said, we cannot do that. Lift our hands against the Lord's anointed. And he tore them up and tore into them with strong words. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. If we're a friend, we're going to help others do right also. Even though they were the ones trying to get him to do wrong. Are you listening to me? They were the ones trying to get him to do wrong. He did take a step in the wrong directions because he cut off the skirt and his heart smote him and he went back and said, well, we shouldn't have done that. No way. He said, you shouldn't do that. And boy, he tore into them and to teach them. So as a friend, we'll help others do right. By the way, with the right spirit, don't be afraid to correct people for good. Don't be afraid to correct people as appropriate for good. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A real friend will say, no, we've got to do right. We have to do right. But the key is we've got to live spiritual so we can. We've got to live so we have the justification to do that. Jesus gives the amazing little parable in Matthew 7, 3, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, 
but cannot see the beam that is in thy own eye. So we need to live spiritual so we can strengthen our comrades to do right. See, if we're living our life always compromising, always living wrong, always taking the easy way, and then something comes up and we're going to try to encourage them to do right, how many understand your words will not have much effect? Mom and dad, your words to your kids will not have much effect. If all they've seen you is lie, all they've seen you is deceive, all they've seen you is cut corners, all they've seen you backslide, and now you tell them, now, when you get to school, make sure you do right. They say, what are you talking about? So we need to be living so we can give that encouragement and give that strengthening. Galatians 6.1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thy also be tempted. So strengthen the comrades. Strengthen others to do right. Two sub-thoughts. Number one, don't let others do wrong for you. Don't let others do wrong for you. How easy it would have been for David to say, I can't raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. No, that's my conviction. It's not right. It's not right for anybody to do that, so I'm not going to do it. But if you don't have that conviction, no, no. Because the word of God is true. So don't let others do wrong for you. Don't let others do wrong because of you. Well, David, he's out to kill you, so we're going to stand for you and we're going to kill him. No, no, don't do it because of me. What to do when you've got your back against the wall, when you find yourself in the corner, there's no way out and the pressure is, and you've got to make the decision, will you do right or not? Stand by your convictions. Number two, settle or strengthen your comrades. Number three, settle the conflict. Settle the conflict. If you can, if you're right, if the situation arises, you know, many times we can just let conflicts go. We don't have to make it a conflict. But in this case, David had to settle the conflict. He had to boldly step out. He had to face the confrontation. He had to face what was going on. He had the courage to go ahead and step up and and face him. Look what it says. Verse number 7, So David stayed his servants with his words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. Problem solved. Saul's gone. Problem solved, he's out of the cave. Problem's gone, no more pressure. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul. If David had not confronted Saul in this situation, God brought him in. If he he had not confronted him to try to settle the conflict, Saul would not have been helped. Saul, Saul wept on this. We find it didn't didn't stick with Saul. He came back a few chapters later and did basically had the same issue still after, after David. But he was helped for a while. When, he, when David dealt with him and David talked to him, he was helped. But if David had not said, I'm not going to stand, I'm just going to just re- take the relief, relief right now. I'm not going to step up and try to settle this conflict. I'm not going to try to intervene on God's behalf. And he said, I'm not going to do it. If he had said that, Saul would not have been helped and David's situation would not have been changed one iota. <laughs> He'd still be on the run. He'd still be on behind with Saul after him, and his men would not have seen and learned. So looking at this very quickly, settle the conflict. Here's how we can deal, properly deal with people, kind of a lesson inside of a lesson. you got people who have problems with you. You're having a problem with the boss. You're having a problem with a co-worker. You're having a problem with somebody who's got something against you. Here is the play that you settle the conflict, at least try to settle the conflict as David did. Are you ready? Here we go. How to settle the conflict. Number one, practice humility. Practice humility. Look in verse 14. I'm sorry. Verse number, verse number 8. David also rose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped his face to the earth and bowed himself. David went after him humbly. He said, we've got to deal with this, but he was humble. He could have said, you're rotten. God took the kingdom away from you. I'm the next king, and I sure could have. No, he was very humble. 
How many understand we can get a lot more accomplished with humility than with pride? Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Wow. Practice humility. Don't be sassy. Don't be angry. Don't tell them off. You're going to deal with these things. He bowed himself first of all and called him king. Practice humility when you have to deal with people. Number two, pronounce truth. Pronounce truth. David begins to lay out the truth. By the way, always tell the truth. Oh, I say, always tell the truth. So he came and says, you've heard that, but look what I've done and look at our situation. Always, always tell the truth and tell only the truth. If you're going to try to settle a conflict, yes, you need to go into it humbly, but make sure you're always truthful. You don't lie to yourself. Make sure you know the truth and tell the truth. Always be truthful in the conversation. Number three, pursue mercy. Pursue mercy. Verse number 10, as he was dealing with Saul, he said, I'm going to confront this. He went out humbly. He went out and gave him the truth, but he also pursued mercy. Look at verse number 10. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee today into my hand in the cave. He said, God brought you into the cave. God brought you, there you were right in front of me. And some bade me kill thee. Others who've been on the run, others that you've tried to kill, they, they told me to kill you. And that seemed like a good reasonable thing. We're mortal enemies. But my eye spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Pursue mercy, even when you're wrong. Even when they are wrong. Pursue mercy. Preacher put it this way, seek reconciliation and not revenge. Seek reconciliation and not revenge. David had all the reasons he ought to revenge, him, revenge himself. Saul from the very beginning had thrown spears and tried to kill him and now chased him all the way. Had, had murdered a whole city because he was after David. But David still sought mercy. He said, I showed you mercy. Psalm 85, 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed, kissed each other. Proverbs 20, 22, say not thou I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord and he shall save thee. Man, pursue mercy. Pursue mercy. Next, provide God's principles. Provide God's principles. In other words, when we're dealing with situations, we need to explain and expound our behavior in light of God's word. In light of God's principles. Because again, we just saw this. He said, I, I, said I, I spared you. Look at verse number 11 again. No, verse number 10. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee into the hand of my, delivered into my hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but my eye spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. So his reasoning, his explanation, why he behaved the way he did, this is because I've got some principles from the Word of God. Always promote God's principles. If they reject God's principles, that's one thing. But we need to make sure we're presenting that. So when you're dealing with this, you say, this is the principle God has. This is the Word of God. This is the principle God has given us. And we're going to operate, I'm trying to operate, on the principles of God. Settle the conflict. There he boldly went out there. Provide God's principles. In other words, everything I do is in light of the Word of God. How many understand Saul was not necessarily in, anxious to hear the principles of God, but still had so he dealt. Very quickly, prioritize relationships. Prioritize relationships. Say, what are you talking about? David and Saul, based upon David starting out, went back to their relationship. They had a lot of issues, but they went back to the relationship. Look at verse number 11. Moreover, David said to Saul, my father. See, yea, and see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. He said, my father. Saul, if you remember, was David's father-in-law. Sometimes in relationships in our homes, sometimes the in-laws and outlaws are called father and mother, sometimes by first name. But he said, Father. He's reminding him, we got a relationship. 
There's a connection here. There's something going on here besides just this squabble that we got going on. There's something going on besides the fact you are after me and trying to hate me and trying to hurt me. Consider who they are. Consider the relationship. In fact, look at verse 15. Verse number 16, And it came to pass, when David made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is that thy voice? Next two words, My son David. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. How much did David's reminding him of their relationship affect his heart? Because now, this old guy, he's been trying to kill him for years. He says, he said, my father, he said, we got some, we got a relationship. We got something going on. We got a shared relationship. And Saul then said, my son, my son. You got conflicts with people? Prioritize the relationship. Consider who they are in the relationship with us. Fathers, sons. Sometimes in the family we just take the wrong. Sometimes we just forgive. So before you attack again, before you launch out, remember the relationship, particularly among God's people. Hello. Well, they, they're not doing it right. All right, but they're still your brother and sister. Yeah, but they're mean to me. But they're still your brother and sister. But they defrauded me. Maybe so, but they're still your brother and sister. So we talk about settling the conflict. Prioritize relationships. Then finally, and probably one of the hardest, permit God's determination. Permit God's determination. He went out to settle the conflict, but he says, you know what? I'm going to let God make the final call. I'm going to let God make the final decision. Look at verse number 11. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee. Verse 15. The Lord therefore be judge, and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thy hand. He said, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to present the cause. I'm going to really, he said, but when it comes down to it, I'm going to let God make the determination. I'm going to let God make the final call. I'm going to let God make the judge. Oh, I tell you what, a lot of times we say, well, that sounds good as long as the Lord does what I want Him to do. That sounds good as long as God makes me sure that I come out on top of this. It's good as long as God makes sure that I don't get in trouble and that I'm blessed from now on and I'll have no more trouble. But no, we just need to do right and let God have the final determination. If it means it's going to get worse and I end up being a martyr, so be it. I'm going to let God be the judge. I'm going to let Him have the final determination. Our goal, our desire is just to do right. You've got two great quotes in there. One from Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, You are not commanded to win success. But you are commanded to do right. Leave the results with the Lord of hosts. So in our conflicts and in our difficulties, let's make sure we're doing right. Let's make sure we're prioritizing relationship and all those things we talk about it. But just do right, do right and let God bring the determination. Let God bring the answer. Let the judge be the judge. John Bunyan said, it is my duty to stand fast in the truth. Though the whole world should fall away. What becomes of me is not my concern, but my faithfulness to God, God's cause is. Let God be the judge. Let God determine. Wow. In a corner. You might find yourself in a corner and being pressured to compromise your convictions. It may be there in the crowd and the booze bottles going around. It may be in a drunken party. It may be the pressure to dress inappropriately. By the way, the world puts pressure on us on how to dress. Hello. The pressure may be to shack up and live an immoral lifestyle or to permit people shacking up in your house in an immoral way. And the pressure's on. And carnal counsel will come along. Oh, you don't want to offend them. And you don't. 
Can you smile at me just a little bit? The pressure's on. We've got our feet, we've got ourselves in a corner. What are we going to do? Let's stand for our convictions. Let's strengthen our comrades. Even those that would try to get you to wrong say, no, let's, let's, let's do right. Then do your best to settle the conflict. But let God be the judge. Let's bow our heads, please.